So the, the question I'd like to address is, is to actually follow up on, on what, he, what Danny said about the deep shift and what it means uh, as a way of transforming society, not just at the technology level, but really at the social and political level. So do you recognize this guy? Who is that? Julian Assange. Okay. He's currently staying for the past three years at the Ecuador Embassy in London, where he's um, hiding from Swedish uh, uh, courts because he doesn't want to appear in front of courts for sexual misconduct allegations, because he's claiming that actually it's not about the allegations, but it's actually about uh, bringing back to the States for, for the WikiLeaks. Okay. So, have you any idea how much uh, the UK has been spending on making sure he does not escape from the embassy? The UK has been spending $25 million in police surveillance to make sure he does not escape. Now, that's a lot of money for somebody accused of sexual misconduct. It would be more in line of uh, trying to catch somebody responsible for major leaks. But even so, $25 million? I mean, is this guy so dangerous that it's worth spending $25 million on, on catching this person? And so it's kind of a puzzle. I mean, is, is, is it so significant that the US government would try to uh, uh, set up a scheme to get him back to the US to prosecute him? So the question is a little bit, what's happening? You know, why, why is this such an important figure? And, and so basically, what's happening in a society that makes this person such a focus of attention? So maybe we need to understand better what's happening in our society. How is it changing? How is it transforming? And I want to argue that the main engine of transformation of our society today is information technology. It's what you do every day. And of course, we do one little thing and we don't realize we might have a big impact, but if you think about history, which history are we living now? Well, this history is driven by information technology. Now, if you want to understand what's happening and what might happen next, well, it's a very challenging thing because it's changing so fast. I mean, even us who are technologists are struggling every day by the pace of change. So how do we understand how is our society changing and where are we going? So maybe you want to reflect on history and ask the question, well, have we seen anything like that before? Well, not quite, but, well, if there is one event in history that mirrors the effect of information technology we see today, that's certainly the invention of the printing press in the 15th century. Now, you read this in history books, and, you know, when I started thinking about this, well, it seemed kind of remote. I mean, you know, the printing press, of course, with books. I mean, we're used to that now. But is it such a big change in society? Yes, it was a huge change in society. You have to imagine in the 15th century, about 5 million books were produced that were handwritten books. And Gutenberg, around 1440, inventing the printing press in its modern fashion. And in the 16th century, about 50 years later, uh, in the next century, about 200 million books were produced. So when we talk about information explosion, well, these people lived this information explosion. Okay? So this is an example of Luther's Bible. Uh, which several hundreds of thousands were copied, uh, uh, printed, and that was distributed all across Europe. In fact, it can be argued that the Protestant Reformation was entirely dependent on the availability of the printing press to disseminate the ideas of Luther and Calvin across Europe for the Protestant Reformation to take hold. Without this, their ideas would not have spread the same way, would not have been able to transform our society. The Protestant Reformation is a major step in our history. It's really about restructuring society in a fundamental way and changing its values. So these people were complaining about the state of society in the, in the 15th century, in the 16th century, saying that the society was unfair, that basically nobility and the church were um, uh, controlling society in a way that was exploiting the rest of people. And we could argue that we are in a fairly similar situation. Today, 85 people in the world control assets as important as the lower half of humanity. 3.5 billion versus 85. And this is only going to get worse. The technology that we are developing every day allows concentration 
of resources, of money, of power across society in an unprecedented way. So we have to think very hard about what our society looks like now and what it's going to look like soon. So if we think about life at the end of the Middle Ages in the Renaissance, well, the structure of society was fairly simple. Nobility on the one hand and the church was controlling society. And uh, while well, you could say today that basically the two forces that control society are businesses and government. Okay? And you could argue in the same way that the social contract that was at the basis of, of Middle Age society, and that was um, uh, um, darkened through corruption, in particular co corruption of the church, well, that we could actually see the same thing in today's society. Basically, businesses and governments have developed fairly unsound relationship, and our uh, businesses are able to put the agenda forward as they see fit. You could also say that medieval society and Renaissance society were organized against the concept of God. That was the religious concept. That was the whole structure and foundation of society. Well, today's society is centered around money, around the market. And if you think about the idea of a religious discourse in our society, well, it's not through classical religion, but things like the invisible hand of the market and there is no alternatives. That's the real re the religious discourse of this day. This is where our new religion is. This is the central values that organize our society. And so the criticism that we see back in the Renaissance would apply pretty much to what we're seeing today. So basically, we could argue that we are up for a, a large conflict in society where people are starting to raise up and emerge and say, no, we want something different. And so maybe this is the reason like, why people like Julian Assange, Edward uh, uh, Snowden, uh, Chelsea Manning, why these people have been prosecuted so violently is because they are being perceived as a threat that is ex existential to our society, at least the society as we know it, as it is currently organized. You know, if you compare to early um, Protestant reformers like Jan Hus or John Wycliffe, Hus was burned at the stake, Wycliffe was exhumed from his tomb 50 years after his death, his uh, bones were burned and, and the ashes were thrown in the river. That's the kind of threats that were perceived by these people that were complaining about how society was organized. Well, maybe the, the people we're seeing now, Snowden, Assange, Manning, are like early reformers. Now, their ideas are not complete. They're missing something. They, they don't really have a plan. They're criticizing, and they may be like early reformers. It's not like Martin and Luther. Martin and Luther came up with a vision of how society should be organized. And so maybe this is what we're up next. What will be the ideas that will organize our society? And I was very happy of hearing Danny talk about distributed trust, because I think that we are in the era of networks. Okay? So if you think about how we want to organize our society, well, what we want is we want to uh, put down the role that gatekeepers play in our society. A lot of things that we do that are related in particular to the financial system, is centered around the notion of a gatekeeper. You need a bank, you need a central bank, you need somebody to check this and that. And these people are basically controlling a lot of things going on there and imposing a certain view, a certain organization, and making a lot of money uh, uh, through this. So distributed trust is a fundamental revolution. I, I, this is another point I argue. If you think about Bitcoin, it's not a small thing. It's a huge thing. I don't like Bitcoin because it's so libertarian, it doesn't have nice social values, but the technology behind it is a real social breakthrough. It will help us reorganize in a society that doesn't need gatekeepers. You know, it, it, things look very similar if you take a Facebook or Uber or Bitcoin. It's big network things, but there's a big difference. In Bitcoin, there is no gatekeeper. There is nobody to control things. There is the implementation of a social contract. And Bitcoin is just about uh, financial transactions, just exchanging money. But these distributed trust systems have a much broader uh, uh, scope than that. They can be used to reorganize the backbone of a society because the backbone is about the finances. We're not going to move past that. We might want to reorganize that. So basically, if you talk about the stock market, why do you need a classical stock market? Why do we all need to pay you know, 1% whenever we do a transaction and a bank does not need to pay 1% when they do a transaction? There's something wrong there, deeply wrong. 
if we were to implement these di distributed trust technologies for the stock market, for insurances, for lending money, we could actually rearrange the backbone of society and transform it radically. Now, this means something important for you because you will be the people building this new society, building the backbone, the infrastructure of this new society. Architecture is politics. As technologists, we usually want to shy away from these questions, but we cannot anymore. They are our questions every day. What do I develop and what society am I creating through this? Thank you very much.